I'm going to speak about the fixation, fixation and spread of mutations, uh, and I'll start off. So just to kind of motivate this question a little bit, like what, why are mutations important or why, why is it important to study and understand them? And what, what, one of the clearest uh, things is, is obviously uh, cancer. So um, it's currently thought that, that, that cancer is basically an accumulation of mutations or an accumulation of mutations that lead to cancer, basically. And if, if we look specifically at the testable epithelium, which is um, what I'm going to be speaking about during this talk. Um, there's a sort of a very famous seminal study by Vogelstein, where he described the Vogelstein progression, or what's now called the Vogelstein progression. And the idea is basically uh, you have the normal epithelium, you you get uh, two hits in the APC gene, or you hit you, you kind of mutate both, AP, both copies of APC, you end up with an adenoma. Uh, and then you get a mutation in RAS and P53 and so forth. And this takes you through a progression of, of kind of um, from adenoma to colorectal or full blown metastatic cancer. Uh, and this, this has been the paradigm for, for, for many years. And, and it was a seminal study or a seminal uh, set of papers. Um, and this, this recently has been like called into question a little bit, whether this actually occurs this way or whether there's a series of mutations that happen in the tissue that then eventually leads to an outbreak. So that's not, not fully understood at this point, I think. But one way or another, you have an accumulation of mutations. Um, and in fact, the, the, the way you're studying this has been using sequencing. So there have been sequencing efforts where you basically, you take a cohort of patients that have got uh, cancer, you extract the tumors, you sequence them, and then you create a catalog of mutations in which you can then try and interpret a bit and say, okay, this mutation appears in 70% of the cases, or, or you can even classify the mutations into different types according to the, to the mutations they have. Um, so that's what, one way of studying this. And then, uh, people have started looking at the other side of the spectrum as, as, as kind of um, as sequencing has become cheaper and started looking at healthy tissue. So if I take healthy tissue and I sequence it, what do I see? How common are mutations and so on? And indeed, you can sort of find some mutations and some uh, oncogenic mutations there in what looks to be healthy tissue. Um, but one of, one of the downsides to, or one of the downsides, uh, yeah, one of the downsides of using sequencing is that on the plus, you can cover a lot of uh, genomic regions, so you can look at the whole genome and you can find very, very a lot of detail in terms of what's mutated. Uh, but often, um, you don't study as much tissue, um, and you don't look as you know at, at many different uh, pieces of tissue in the same patient and across patients. And th this type of thing is not done as much. So that's something that that that, that is um, I'll, I'll mention in a moment. Um, but ultimately, this this leads us to the question of how do mutations accumulate at all in the tissues, uh, and also what is the effect of the early mutation? So, when you have healthy tissue and suddenly you get a mutation in the cell, what, you know what happens next? Um, and so, so, if you think about this question, it, what becomes important is um, how does the tissue actually work? So, so um, that, that that ends up becoming important. So, so we know that the cells divide; they can they can introduce errors. So, when a cell divides, it has to make a copy of its DNA. Uh, as it makes the copy in the DNA, it can introduce an error. And if that goes through, if that passes through the area, internal error checking of the cell, let's say, uh, then you have a cell that's mutant, that's got a mutation in it. Um, but of course, depending where it happens in the tissue, uh, that might be important or not. So, so the, but depending on the tissue structure, you have certain cells that are turned over and others that are turned over less and so on. So basically the cell the, it is mutated and is in the tissue, so it has to somehow become fixed. So if you look specifically in the colonic epithelium, you have a, you, the way it's structured is you have these kind of crypts, which is this kind of little uh, drawing I have here on the right. And you basically have the stem cells located at the base mixed in with another cell type. And then these cells produce uh, and fuel the, the rest of the epithelium by producing cells that come out of here, undergo a burst of, of division, and then migrate out and carry out their function and eventually get shed. So you have this constantly going on production of cells, they carry out, the, they divide, carry out their function and, and leave. Uh, and in the meantime, also what happens in the base is that the cell, the stem cells themselves, one of them can kind of leave and then one of the neighboring stem cells will, will replace it. And that effectively leads to kind of stochastic replacement and almost like a competition uh, where stem cells are kind of replacing each other over time. Um, and so if you think about it, if a mutation occurred somewhere in the kind of middle part here, most likely it'll just get flushed out. It might divide a couple of times and then it'll just migrate out, carry out its function and leave. And so the mutation has had no effect on the tissue. Um, however, if the mutation occurs in the stem cell, then the stem cells, as they go dividing, if the mutant starts winning and replacing the other ones, it can end up colonizing the whole gland and becoming fixed in the tissue. 
Uh, and not only that, after, after it becomes fixed, it's known that glands can kind of divide in two. So this whole script structure can actually replicate itself and divide in two. And that happens in normal, normal healthy tissue. So if, if we want to study this process and characterize it and understand it a bit better, how do we do that? Um, so, so the way we approach it is to try and use a neutral mutation. So a mutation that occurs naturally in the tissue that in principle shouldn't affect the, the stem cells very much, and we can actually visualize it. And so that, that there was, there was um, papers published uh, a couple of decades ago where they, they proposed this kind of experiment called mild periodic acid shift which looks at the mucin and basically if the mucin is is not chemically modified which it which it should be it stains purple and that normally happens because you have a, a, a mutation in a particular gene and so basically this allows you to look at a big piece of tissue and then you find the cells are the mucin cells are actually a different color so you can actually see them and so that, that's very useful and you can uh, yeah and so this is in principle we think it's a neutral mutation so okay so we, we have this uh, piece of tissue this is actually a biopsy from a from a human to from a patient um, um, and so we, what do we actually measure? And once we measure it, what do we actually analyze? Uh, how do we analyze it to actually extract a, a kind of some understanding of how this is working? Uh, and the way we approach this is to use um, a combination of experiments and theory that we do, that we developed in 2013, or we published in 2013, where we used a mouse model uh, that had been developed by some collaborators in Cambridge combined with mathematical modeling to pick apart how this thing was working. So I'm, I'm gonna briefly describe how this worked in mouse and how we kind of carried it over to human. So, so, so the, 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 the mouse model that we used was developed by my collaborator in Cambridge. And it was a sort of very clever system where basically they had um, a reported gene that had been inserted in the Rosa 26 locus. Uh, so this means it's gonna be constantly expressed and so you have this reported gene that's constantly on. And the way it's constructed, the, the gene is actually out of frame. So actually, when, it, when the gene, when the mRNA is translated into protein, it, it's actually translated incorrectly. So it starts in the wrong place. So it, 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 it translates it incorrectly. And the protein is not functional. It doesn't do anything. Um, and they, they introduced within this gene um, a microsatellite, which consists of just basically 30 copies of the letters CA. And the reason they put that in is because that's actually an unstable uh, DNA sequence where when the DNA is copied, it can, it's more likely to make a mistake there. Um, and if it makes a mistake by including an extra copy of CA, then what happens is the whole gene gets pushed forwards. And then when it gets translated, now it gets translated correctly and it produces a protein that's actually functional. So this is a very clever system where basically you have cells that are like uh, cells that are dividing and then a mutation will occur in the cell. And when it does occur, the cell lights up. Uh, and all the daughter cells are also lit up. So you have a mutation and it, and it kind of propagated through the lineage. It's extremely infrequent. So it doesn't happen all the time. It happens rarely. And one thing you observe, if you look at the kind of mouse, you find that if this is actually a crypt as seen from the bottom here. And basically this one is a completely mutant crypt and this is a partially mutant one. So you see these kind of patterns emerging and just, just as another nice image you can see here from the side this is actually a crypt seen from the side and you've got the the crypt the stem cells would be here at the bottom and then you've got the kind of um, streams of um, mutant cells uh, migrating up the villas uh, this, this mutation is also completely neutral just it's just expressed as something you can see so what do you actually measure and what do you do with it well what, what you find is if you if you distinguish between these two patterns so the, the partly populated mutants, so partly mutated crypts and fully mutated crypts. So these are these I would call partial and monoclonal. The partial ones uh, remain constant with the age of the mouse. If you look at mice of different ages, they all have the same, more or less the same number of these kind. Whereas this one appears to accumulate maybe approximately linearly with age. So that's something that you can actually model with a mathematical model. So specifically we use the stochastic model and with a, ver a very simple stochastic model that only had that only accounts for the number of stem cells at what rate they replace each other and the probability of mutation with these replacements you can actually already without even looking too much at the numbers just uh, uh, get a good qualitative behavior so basically the model predicts that you should get this kind of constant number of partials and uh, a linear accumulation of these 
so, so if you look at the equations, if you disregard this latter part, which actually explains the behavior at the beginning, you basically end up with a linear thing. And it actually only depends on the mutation probability and the rate of stem cell replacement. And then if you look at the height of these partials, it actually only depends on the number of stem cells and the mutation. So basically the parameters have separated very nicely. So if you just calculate the slope and the height, you've already got information about how this is working. Uh, and this is something you can actually fit to the data. And this is what we did in that paper. And that gives you a prediction or an inference for the number of stem cells that are competing in each gland and the rate at which they're replacing each other. And one interesting thing we found was that if you actually go into the crypt base and you look at how many cells there look like stem cells, so morphologically the sh their shape and size indicates what we would think as, as, a, as a stem cell, there's actually many fewer of them that are actually competing. So if you counted them, you'd get around 16 to 20 or 30 or something like that. But actually our model predicts that actually only five of them are kind of replacing each other. So perhaps only the bottom five are engaging in this kind of competition and all the other ones are maybe already on their way out or have, have committed to some particular fate. Um, so, so going back to the human data, the human tissue and the human data, this is the kind of approach we wanted to bring to this um, to try and understand this a bit better. Um, and so this data is basically in theory, healthy tissue. So uh, I, I put healthy in quotes because um, very rarely do you um, extract a person and so a piece of a person's intestine if they're healthy. But um, in, in theory, if they have anything, this tissue has been taken far away from the lesion. And so in theory, it's, uh, it's healthy. Um, we, have, uh, we have actually done experiments since with other types of tissue, um, which, which certainly is healthy because it's unrelated to uh, gut disease. Um, and we also have a neutral mutation. So this kind of impasse thing where we can stain and find and actually visualize the mutations. So this is important. And as I said before, that was published something like 20 years ago. So, so just to show you a little bit and to kind of um, give you an intuition for, for, for kind of what we think we're seeing, um, you, you basically have these kind of stem cells competing with each other or the crib base where they're kind of replacing each other. And what's happened is that one of them has picked up a mutation and we can actually visualize it so we can actually see it. Um, while all the other ones around it are uh, wild type. Um, and what can happen at this point is that one of the wild type cells can replace it and push it, push a mutant out, in which case you would end up with just a normal crypt with no indication of mutations. Or conversely, you could get the mutant starting to replace the neighbors, and then you'll get, find something that's midway and through that competition where some of the cells are mutant and some of the cells are wild type. And then at some point, this is going to eventually become fixed. So all the stem cells are now mutant, and now there's no possibility of wild types uh, creeping in there. And what can happen after this is that this, this actually divides into two. So what, what will happen is that these, these crypts will start dividing, and you'll get something like this. So you'll get a patch of mutant crypts. So you'll see you know, tens of thousands of crypts and nothing at all, and suddenly you get a patch like two, three, or four, or whatever. Uh, and you can actually catch these things midway, so you can actually find a crypt that's midway through separating. Uh, and I, I should clarify also, um, they can also join. So it's actually known that two crypts can actually join together. Uh, I, I'm not gonna speak about it in this talk and we have done work on this, but I, I'm not gonna speak about the fusioning, the, the joining. Um, but what, what, one thing I will highlight is that we found very useful to detect these kind of things. So this kind of in-between case where it's midway through carrying out that fission or fusion. And because we don't know whether it's fission or fusion, we often refer to it as food feed. Um, and, these, and it doesn't necessarily have to be mutant. You see these kind of things all throughout the tissue, speckled throughout the tissue. Um, so anyway, th th this is kind of like the bigger picture of what's happening. So you mutation in stem cell, competition can disappear, can populate, and, and can also then fission. So this is like the general mode that we, that we believe that the mutations spread. So if, if we want to do a similar kind of thing of fitting the model, we need to somehow extract data from these images. Um, in the case of the mouse, it was much easier because there were many, many more events, whereas here we have to look at a lot of tissue and the mutations are very, very rare. Um, so the way we got around this was to, was to draw on deep learning. So we, do, we kind of um, used a deep learning network to do this. Um, and this allowed us to do very high throughput. And just, just to give you, if you're not familiar with deep learning, just to give you a very kind of uh, basic intuition of this, um, you, you have this kind of big model that's made up of say 30 million parameters, so a huge model um, with lots of little tiny operations that will, that will all together do something quite complex. 
uh, and this this kind of uh, this kind of model and algorithm they they learn by example. So rather than so rather than telling your algorithm how to do something, which is how you would do classically, you would do any kind of image analysis or anything else. You you would have to meticulously tell the algorithm look for some color that's above this level. Once you've found that, make sure that the, the group of pixels is larger than this size and some distance or something else. So you'd have to give it a set of very, very clear algorithmic instructions. With these algorithms, what you do is that you have huge amounts of parameters. So it's an extremely flexible model set up in a particular way to, to, to kind of enhance this, but I, I won't go into details there. And basically learn by example. So you, you would give it an image like this as input and then you would actually give it this as an output and you tell it, this is what I want you to find, this, this thing, which is zeros and ones. And then it, it'll run the image through this network. This one is called a UNet, um, do, doing all these operations with 30 million parameters. And the output will be, well, it'll try and make as similar as possible to this. It'll start with a random guess and then it has a, a, a efficient way of bit by bit improving the, the distance between what it predicts from this image and what you've given it, so until it matches as, as well as possible. So basically, by giving it lot, by by having this very complex model that runs very efficiently on the computer and giving it lots of examples, it can learn by itself how to do that specific task, and it does it extremely well. Uh, and here, here you can see kind of an example of like a, a little section of the tissue where there's let's say uh, one or two thousand crypts or whatever and it's found them all and it's colored them in well we've colored them in red what's detected Actually, so, so it also it finds the crypts it kind of characterizes them finds the mutational status uh, and then stores all this uh, the mutational part is is we're still working on it so it can do it can find the mutations but we've uh, since we don't have that many mutations to train it on we kind of overshoot a little bit and then manually curate the results so it gives you a, a small candidate list and then you can go through and curate that and we're working on improving that to automate it even further. So, okay, so we, we, we've got our tissue. We, we do, we run this uh, deep learning for all the patient samples and we're gonna get counts of crits and mutations and also some spatial position, which I'll, I'll speak about later, but how, how do we use the similar thing to what we did with the, with the mouse? So the mouse data had some nice clean patterns. So you had like more or less a linear accumulation, more or less something that's flat. But in this case, so in the mouse, we had like hundreds of mutations. So maybe for this one, we had like 500 mutations detected for a single mouse. Um, because by, by design, it was mutable, whereas this is a lot a lot rarer. So just to give you an idea of what, what, what we expect to see, here's some simulations where if the dotted red line is, is the frequency that we're using to simulate, and then we're just sampling from it 100 million crypts. So if I, if, if I were able to get for one patient, which, which we're not able to do, 100 million crypts, and you calculated the frequency at different ages, you would see a very nice clean trend uh, uh, according to the simulation, of course. It'll never be that clean. Um, but the, the, the point is, if you then measure, say, 100,000 crypts, then suddenly this will start dispersing and it won't be so clean. Uh, and then if you actually measure the number that we measure, which is closer to 10,000, 20,000, and each patient has a slightly different number, then the frequencies will look uh, messier and you'll see less of a trend. So, so Although here you can see a trend and that looks pretty nice, we won't see that so much in the patient data. Um, but this is something we can account for using statistical models. So we, we use a, a very simple Bayesian model to do, to do this kind of fit. Uh, and if you're interested in this kind of thing, I, I can briefly explain. So we use a binomial likelihood um, where we're putting in the number of crypts for a patient that we're counting. We're trying to estimate the proportion of, of, of mutant crypts and then we have the actual number of mutant crypts we measured. And then that proportion we're saying follows a, a linear uh, trend with the age of the patient, some intercept, and then um, the slope of accumulation of the mutations, which we actually make one per patient. And then we use a hierarchical model to draw in all of these uh, this population of slopes into a, a normal distribution uh, with some mean invariance that we infer from the data. But we use this hierarchical model to kind of uh, gather this in a, a little bit. Um, so if we, if we use all this, um, or we bring all this in, and so here you can actually see the kind of data for the MPAS. Um, uh, and like I said, we could find the full and partial. So these are the partial levels over different patients. So if we fit this model and we make inference of the parameters, we find that actually the number of stem cells is quite low. It's around seven stem cells per gland. Uh, but the really interesting thing that came out of this is that the replacement rate was extremely slow. So 1.3 replacements per year. 
So it's very slow. And if you put these two things together, that suggests that, uh, well, so this is 100 times slower than the mouse, and it suggests that from the point that you get a mutation in the cell to the point it becomes fixed in the gland takes an average seven years. So that's a huge amount of time. Um, and this kind of suggests maybe a window of opportunity for drug intervention. So if you're able to treat while this is midway through competing and you can weaken the mutant cell or you can strengthen the wild type cells in some way, then you can skew this competition and actually out, the, the mutant can be outcompeted potentially. And this is the posterior distribution of the two parameters of the stem cells and replacement rates, and you can see the correlation there and the, and the credible intervals. Um, so, so what else can we do this, with this? So can, can we study, say, other mutations with this? Um, and so my collaborator, so, so the previous thing we looked at was actually published. So 20 years ago, somebody came up with this idea of looking at the mucin and figuring out whether it was mutant or not. So my collaborator came up with, started testing other ideas on how we could actually get similar kind of things. And so what he did was um, he came up with this great idea, which was to look at X-linked genes. So the X-linked genes, the advantage is that um, only one of the copies will be expressed in any individual, uh, regardless if they're male or female. Um, and so only one of them will be expressed. And that means that if it gets mutated, you will immediately see it. Whereas if you've got two copies and one gets mutated, you might not see it. Um, and so the way to, and then so what he did is he found uh, genes and therefore proteins that were expressed throughout all the kind of colonic epithelium. Um, they were X-linked and then he did tests with antibodies to stain them. So here you can see the brown is the actual protein that's being detected and the loss of brown means that you've actually lost uh, the active form of the protein. And he would double check with two different types of antibodies. So he did like a very thorough meticulous job of figuring out whether this was actually measured what we, what we wanted. And initially he came up with two proteins we could look at and we could measure with this antibody assay. And so he, he found a, a gene called MAOA and another one called STAG2. And so STAG2 is kind of known to have oncogen or some amount of oncogenic activity. And, and by now we actually have a, lot, a larger number. So, so this is quite nice because uh, we could look at MAOA, which in principle is not, not far as we know, linked to oncogenic activity. Uh, we could find these kind of completely mutant and partially mutant crypts. Uh, we could gather all this up and do our kind of analysis. Uh, and what we found is that we found in general a lower frequency than the MPAS, so two to three times lower. And this, this could lead you to ask the question, you know, are these dynamics altered? Like, are the cells actually less fit for these? And that's something that we can do a very simple check with the model to actually answer that question. So if you recall, when I, when I described the model earlier, I mentioned that actually the slope and the partials each had a piece of information of the stem cell dynamics but also the mutation probability. It turns out if you do the ratio, the mutation part drops out and you just end up with something that depends only on the dynamics of stem cells, so the number and the replacement. So that means that you have a very, like the model is telling you, you have a very simple thing that you can extract from the data and robust thing, calculate it, and you can just compare mutations. And so that's what we did. And so um, we calculated that for MPAS and MAA, so this ratio, and we get the, the credible intervals completely overlap and therefore we don't have evidence that they're particularly different. Therefore, it seems like we would expect them both to be neutral. And even though MPAS is three times more frequent, actually when you calculate the dynamics part, they are actually approximately the same. Or we don't have evidence that they're very different. So, so okay, so we have something that we think is working well. We have some parameters and we have a way of distinguishing whether something's actually causing um, a bias or not. But can we actually get more evidence to convince ourselves that this modeling thing is working and that we can trust what we're saying? Um, and so actually, you know, when we had actually put this thing together and we were working on more aspects of the model, somebody actually published a paper where they calculated something quite similar and they estimated the rate at which stem cells were replacing each other. So in 2014. Um, and it was much, much, much faster than what we had estimated. It was about 100 times faster. So we, we, we sort of wondered whether, whether we were making a mistake. And so we, we sought for a kind of an orthogonal system to validate this. And what we ended up doing is we found a historical data set where they'd looked at this MPAS assay on radiation, patients who'd received radiation. So they would have received radiation and then they would have been followed up and they would have had biopsies taken and these clone frequencies measured. Um, and the reason this is interesting validation data is because 
the what the radiation does is it induces mutations amongst other things. And so what you have is a pulse of mutations. So all the mutations happen at one time point and then they just evolve and then just the stem cell part takes over and they just evolve over time. And so we can just take, regardless of how the mutation occurred, we can just take, say, so the, here in this plot, you can see the black dots of the data. We can just take the first time point as the initial conditions, the first value, and then just predict forward in time what the model tells us should happen without doing any fitting, uh, any further fitting aside from just taking the first time point and, and just initializing the prediction from there. And what we find is that our MPAS and MA predictions seem to fit a, uh, substantially better than the, uh, the other paper that was published, uh, giving us confidence that the kind of time scales we were talking about and kind of inferring seem to be much better and I'm much more in line with what, what, what seems to have happened. Um, one of the time points is, is a little bit off with respect to what we'd expect, but it's still possible that mutations or some of these things are still getting mutated as, the, as you go through time or take a little bit of time to appear. Um, but generally speaking, with with no fitting, just taking the first time point and simulating forward, you kind of you kind of get a nice uh, prediction that's comparable to the data. So okay, we we kind of trust our parameters a bit more, and we think we can kind of infer things a bit better. So um, can we? What can we say about this oncogenic mutation? What can we say uh, about Stag two? And actually. So again, we, we stain, we can find these two patterns, like the monoclonals, the partials. We can fit our, our model using the sampling statistic. Um, and what we find immediately is that it has a much higher frequency, both in the, both in the MA and the MPAS, the two neutral marks that we think we have. Um, so, so again, now you have the question, is it actually advantaged in some way? Is it actually changing the dynamics? Or is it just like a bigger gene that's more likely to be mutated and that's why you see more of it? Um, so again, we can draw on this idea of taking that ratio that I mentioned earlier, and you find that, um, actually I can use a pointer here, can't I? Um, you find that the MPAS and the MAOA have very similar kind of patterns or ratio, whereas the STAC2 is clearly kind of positively biased. Uh, and I won't go into the details, but you can, you can uh, modify the model so that you can actually quantify the level of advantage that you have and stack two, according to this, was coming up almost at the limit that you can get of advantage. So, in other words, if you get a, if you get a mutation in that stem cell, it's very likely to outcompete the other ones. And actually, if you look at the probability of mutation, so you how how often does stack two get mutated in a cell? You find that actually it's fairly similar to MAOA. They're actually not that different. This is on the log scale, so it's a little bit larger, but it's not that different. Um, Whereas once it gets mutated, then it certainly has a strong advantage in the dynamics change. And one thing that we kind of actually got asked as we were trying to publish this was um, how do you know that STAC2 is actually causing that advantage? Because STAC2 is actually known to relate to chromosomal instability. So it could be that STAC2 is not changing the cells in any way. It's just making it far more likely that they acquire more mutations. And that's where the advantage is coming from. And so we thought, okay, well, this is something we can actually check explicitly. We can actually model this and see whether the model could actually explain the data. And so we actually did that. We, we actually set up a system where we had mutation one and mutation two. When mutation one occurs, then mutation two becomes far more likely. And then mutation two is the, actually the one that can change the dynamics. And then this is the kind of dotted line is the actual data we measure. And then we tried a couple of uh, cases where we made the second mutation a thousand times more likely than the first or a hundred thousand times more likely than the first. Uh, and what we found is that even if you make it a hundred thousand times more likely, it's still not able to get to this point of what we see in the data, which sort of makes sense once you think about it, because you have some, you have certain stem cells there. If you mutate one of them and then it divide, it starts replacing the other ones, you've only got a handful of mutated, a handful of replacements to be able to meet, to get the second mutation. And by the time it actually hits, you might already be almost clonal or the mutation might have been lost. So it makes sense that you can't actually get to that point. But it was interesting to kind of follow it up with, with some simulations and kind of ask this question. Um, and it, it, even more so, a couple of years after we published this, there was a paper that looked at blood stem cells and STAG2. And they found that actually, if you knocked out STAG2, the stem cells would, became more stem-like and were less likely to leave the niche. In, in the case of, of uh, bone marrow, I believe. 
and that makes a lot of sense. That might be a mechanism by by which this could happen. If you if you get a mutant stem cell and a mutant stem cell refuses to leave, and then the other ones leave around and it starts replacing them, then it's a mechanism to kind of popular colonize the the, the crypt uh, more easily. So so okay. So you so we have this um, way of figuring out what the stem cells are doing. But what about after the stem cells have become fixed? Can we actually figure out what's happening as the crypts divide? So, so as I said, like you can have a mutant and it can divide in two, and then what happens is you end up with these patches. So you can find patches of one or two or three or whatever um, mutant crypts and or even larger patches. So actually, if you just model this as a kind of pure bet process, you, you can predict a distribution of sizes that you should see and how that should change over age, uh, with age, and you can actually fit it to the data. And from that, you can predict the rate of fission. And that's something that we did for all three clonal marks. And we found that MPAS and MAOE, again, were ball, ballpark the same kind of values, despite the fact the frequency of MPAS is higher. The distribution of sizes was uh, completely comparable, and the rates that you infer are completely comparable. Whereas STAG2 seems to be enhanced. So that's like it's approximately three times higher rate. And this is a, an exponential we're looking at on average. So that three times higher produces much bigger patches. And you can kind of see it in the data if you kind of look at it. So, so it's interesting, STAG2 is actually not only does it make the stem cells that acquire STAG2 more fit to compete against the other ones, but somehow it seems to affect the fission process. And I should say that fission is not fully understood. At this point, it's not really known what the mechanism is for fission or, or fusion for that matter. So uh, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, my uh, my collaborator started developing more clonal marks and more, sorry, I refer to them as clonal marks, they're mut mutations. Um, uh, we, so, so, so find more mutations that you can visualize. So you can effectively look at a huge piece of tissue and find, like, find the mutations visually, uh, which allows us to look at a lot of tissue and a lot of patients and focus on one mutation and and, and look at a lot of detail of just that mutation. Um, so from this panel, uh, which we now have seven, and we might even have more by now, but this is the the latest um, one I have. Um, so, so H DAC six, uh, when it gets mutated, seems to have. So, sorry, this is this is the slope of a partial. So, this is the assessment of how neutral or, or biased it is, and this is the fission rate of how much once it's become fixed, how much how much it fissions. So, H DAC six seems to have uh, weaker stem cells. So, the moment the, the moment a stem cell gets mutated for H DAC six, it seems to be that it becomes weaker, uh, and it's more likely to be outcompeted by the wild type cells. However, once it becomes fixed in the crypt, the fission is unaffected. It seems to be able to just divide, no problem. And here we can always see, already see something that's interesting where it seems like the, the stem cell ch changes in stem cell behavior don't seem to be completely correlated with the fission. So it seems to be like some mechanisms are not entirely connected, although they might be a bit connected in some way. Um, and then we have like several marks, including the two I mentioned earlier, and another couple that seem to be neutral or at least are consistent with neutral dynamics. Um, and the fission is similar except for p53. p53 is, is a uh, very important gene in cancer. This is often called the guardian of the genome. And that, when you mutate it, it doesn't seem to change the dynamics very much, but actually it seems to affect fission and the, and the crypts seem to divide more once they have it. Uh, and then we find another uh, gene related to cancer, KDM6A, which seems to be, seems to give an advantage, potentially not as much as advantage of STAG2, although the credible intervals overlap, so we don't know for sure. However, the fusion, so fission seems to be larger. So KDM6A seems to be able to produce sort of larger patches and kind of divide more. So, so, so in terms of all this kind of panel of genes, where does this take us? So we, we can say interesting things about a few genes uh, and, then, and, and understand like how the dynamics are and how the mutations spread in human patients and humans. Um, but can we do anything else with this? Uh, can we utilize it in some other way? And of course, of course we, this is something we've tried to do. Um, so as I said, we have some mutations, we've characterized their dynamics, so we know how frequent they are, we know how they accumulate with age, we know um, patient to patient variability to some extent, we know the fission rates. Um, so can we use this in some way? And so what, what we did was try to apply these assays to, to look at anomalous behavior in tissue. So can we take a tissue uh, and use the fact that we know how these mutations work to, to figure out if they're patches where the mutations are behaving erratically, maybe they're accumulating more, suggesting there's some underlying process that's altered 
So we're actually using these mutations as a, as a readout of what the, what the underlying stem cells are doing. Uh, and that's one thing we looked at. And so for instance, um, APC or KRAS are clear, uh, uh, oncogenic genes that we can't do the staining for, but however they do, we know that they, they probably do produce large patches of altered dynamics. So can we use these mutations to try and locate these things? And then secondly, also um, we've applied it to looking around tumors and looking at the, the, the dynamics of crypts in the vicinities of large tumors. So, and, and also um, th this leads to the question of, so, so these, can, can we actually integrate this, this mutational information? So instead of using them individually, separately, can we actually integrate them together? And the way these things are, are measured, you have a piece of tissue and then you make sort of slices, um, effectively salami slices, as grotesque as that may sound. Um, and then each one of them you stain with a different assay. So one of one of the sections you might stain with this uh, MAOA antibody and STAC2, and you'll basically measure them all separately. And so we wanted to integrate this all so that we could just say this script here, what mutations does it have? And this one over the other one here, what mutations does it have? And do two of them coincide in the same script and that kind of stuff. Uh, and that actually turns out to be a little bit tricky. And we actually solved that using deep learning again. Um, and so, so the, to be able to do that, you basically need to be able to find the same crypt in two sections. And that's, again, you're talking about tens of thousands of crypt, 20,000 crypts. And as you make sections, the tissue tears a bit. As you cut deeper in, you start losing crypts um, and so forth. So it's actually not, not trivial to kind of find the same ones. And also the tissue kind of rotates and moves around as they measure it, so as they kind of fix it. So it's not so, so easy to do. So, so if you think about it, how would you actually do this manually? Like somebody asked you to do it, how would you do it? So, so one way of doing it would be to just find a crypt like this crypt here and say, okay, I'm gonna to go to the section below it and I'm gonna just try and see if I can find a crypt that looks like it. So maybe I find this crypt and I say, okay, yeah, they look quite similar. How could I get more confidence that it's actually the crypt I think? And one way would be to actually take a zoom out and then look at the environment and say, well, does this environment look similar to it? And I can take even a further step out and say, well, does the, you know, the place within the tissue, does it look similar? And if you kind of coalesce these things, then yes, you, you have like a better way of telling that. So that's exactly what we do with these kind of, uh, with this new, uh, neural network. Uh, and the way the network works is um, you basically take each of these levels of zoom, you, you run it through uh, a small network, which if you work in deep learning, these are inception blocks. And so we run it through this series of inception reduction blocks. Uh, we flatten it at the end and we just end up with a vector. And then we stick these vectors together uh, and we use it in this kind of Siamese network. So the idea of a Siamese network is that you create two identical networks to each other with exactly the same parameters and you feed two images, one through each of the networks. And the outcome of, the out, uh, the outcome of this is to produce two vectors. And then you train the network so that the vectors, uh, when you compare them against each other, are uh, most similar when it's the same thing and most different when it's different things. So you feed it pair, pairs of images and then you tell it these two are the same thing, these two are different things. And then it figures a way of representing these things as vectors that allow it to compare directly and say whether they're the same thing or not. Um, I should say, I think, I, I believe this is how the face unlock works with your phone. So if you have a face unlock, it's actually probably trained this network with loads of pairs of faces so that it can take a picture of a face, uh, uh, pass it through one of these networks that produces a vector that's been trained so that these vectors are as close to each other, probably in Euclidean distance, uh, when it's the same person, even if they're wearing sort of a hat or funny uh, glasses and nose or whatever, it'll still kind of work quite well. Um, so, 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 okay, so we trained this on Crips, we trained on this, this, it actually worked very well. It doesn't work perfectly. So if you take two crypts and you say, so if you take a crypt and you try and find the exact same crypt in the 20,000 other ones, it kind of tends to narrow down to one, two or three. So it's not perfect in that sense. But if you do a pre-rotation with a very zoomed out image uh, and you kind of figure out ballpark where things are, then you can immediately uh, match it all and it works very well. And that, just to give you an intuition about what's happening with these kind of encodings, um, Here's, here's a couple of examples. So here's like a crypt and it's two levels of zoom. And then we compare it against another section in which the, the, correct, the, the comparison is correct. And then a second one where it's actually incorrect. So if you look to the crypt, uh, here it's obviously the same one, but it's been stained with a different assay. And if you scatter plot the vectors of descriptions of this one against that one, 
if they're very similar, they should fall in a diagonal line. And if they're very different, they should start dispersing a lot. So when you compare this one against this one, you can see it falls fairly diagonal. When you compare this one against this one, which has nothing to do, then you kind of get something that doesn't look as, uh, as clear. Uh, I should say that this is then used in a next step that's that's kind of um, non-linear. So it could be that it's giving more importance to some of these than others, but just to give you a, just an idea of what's going on. And then if you look at the second level of zoom, these two are obviously very similar and it gives a very good um, comparison. And these two are very different. And again, it kind of goes all over the place. And they even further zoom like this one and this one are obviously very similar, it gets it well. And these two, it's kind of horrendously different. And it, it kind of knows it. Um, and then if you look at another example here where, where we chosen a crit that's maybe more similar to it, but it's actually not this one. These two are now starting to gather a bit more. So if you look at this one, it actually says, okay, it looks a bit more similar. It could actually be the same one. Whereas here, obviously, it's slightly more accurate, but slightly better fit, but still, this could be one. But when you take a zoom out, you find that these two are good. And this one, it starts saying, no, no, this isn't the same thing. And if you take even a further step out, it's like, no, okay, this has nothing to do with each other and we can recognize it, whereas this one is very similar and it kind of falls along the diagonal. So you, so you get a feeling for this encoding and how it's creating these vectors and it's finding a way of representing this so that you can just compare them against each other and find like a good match. Um, and here's in this thing in action where it's kind of matching all the crypts to each other. And most of the lines are kind of uh, parallel showing that it's kind of matching the, the correct thing. And we did a we did a comparison where we took a block that had been sectioned into 20 sections and then we found the same crypts throughout all those 20 sections and here you can see a few examples you can see also as you cut through the tissue you start losing chunks of tissue like you start getting into the muscle and so on so it's normal that some of these have only got one or two sections so so actually i should say this is a scatter plot where every point is a crypt and the color is the number of uh, sections that you found it in so some regions you found 15 sections, so you kind of cut through the whole crypt nicely and you detected it and matched it well. And some other sections you just didn't, you had just a handful of, you know, handful of sections or whatever. But this is a nice example that you can see that it can match a good number of sections and then it's finding the crypt all the way through. And like I said, these change, the morphology changes a little bit. You go through and you get tears and you lose certain crypts and it's still able to work even with that. So, so, okay, so we can integrate all these things. We can have a single piece of tissue and we can find for every single crypt the mutational status for uh, as many as many mutations as we've measured with this assay. And so in, in order to find like regions that are behaving differently, uh, we used a uh, marker friend of field. And so we, we had, uh, so within the, this, this um, framework, we had two parts. So we had the, the likelihood that describes the frequencies of what you would expect to see or what you'd see if it's mutant or, or you know, when it's altered dynamics or it's just normal dynamics. And then um, a kind of energy part that kind of links uh, different uh, spatial aspects. So the things that are close to each other are more likely to be part of the same state. This is kind of like a, a, a hidden Markov model, but um, in 2D or, well, yeah, 2D. Um, so, so what is it we actually infer when we do this um, and what do we actually use? So, so, so we have known parameters. When we get a piece of tissue, we know the age of the patient. And we also have the parameters for the mutation. So we know the frequency we would expect for a, for a patient of that age for each of the seven mutations. We know the patch size distribution, how big should the patches be. And we also have the frequency of these fusion fission mixed forms. So we have a bunch of stuff that we know should be happening. And, and we're actually also accounting for population variation because we actually, when we fit these models, we account for population variability. So we know kind of more or less the range of frequencies that we'd expect if it's normal. So we use that as, as priors for the, the wild type and for the mutant, we use a prior that's a bit larger than that. Um, and basically the output of this is gonna be a region that's been detected and then the mutation uh, frequency in that region or the, 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 the accumulation of mutations in that region, the slope that we infer for that region, and then the normal wild type one. And then we also get the fission, so how much these things are fissioning within the mutant patch and outside. And this is represented here. So zero is the, the wild type and one is the kind of altered patch. And, and this is a mutation accumulation and this is the fission part. So we... we so we've got this working and we've been trying to roll it out. We've had a few issues in getting blocks with enough sections of the type we want where we don't use too much tissue. And here we have one where we actually only had two clonal marks. But what we wanted is a proof of principle. And so we actually 
took a block that had been sequenced by a collaborator. So a collaborator had taken a section, mashed it up or blended it up, uh, probably something more subtle than that, but basically they, they kind of blended it up and then they took an average measurement for the mutation of KRAS and they found there must be in there a large number of cells that are KRAS mutant, but unclear where, because it's all been kind of mashed up. So we thought, well, can we take this and can we try and infer due to altered dynamics, what region might actually have that mutation in it, where that is. And if we can get that to work, then can we just roll it out over all tissue and see if we can start finding how common are these kind of like altered dynamic patches that are kind of quite strongly altered. Um, and as you can see here, like it didn't detect between wild type and mutant or wild type and altered, the a change in the, the clone dynamics or, or for MAOA or for stack two. Uh, or for the fission part, but it did actually in those fusion fission mixed things, it found a huge difference in, in the part that it thought was altered and the part that wasn't, and it kind of detected it to be down here. And when um, we actually went in and looked at the block, it, so it's basically down here, we zoomed in, it does actually look a little bit funky. Uh, and we spoke to um, some um, co collaborators that are pathologists who look at this kind of stuff all the time, and they told us that looks like a polyp uh, and a polyp that's probably KRAS mutant because often these big polyps are KRAS mutant. So actually the, the algorithm had kind of predicted this and although kind of the crypts look a little bit dysmorphic, that's not something we were using for the algorithm. So it kind of picked up just on the fact that there were lots of uh, fusion fission figures uh, mixed amongst these things. So again, this, this it's quite preliminary and, and we haven't rolled it off in, through, through enough blocks so we don't know whether it works always, but it, it, at least it, we got it to work quite well in, in one of the cases. We tried on two or three and it worked well on this one. So, that, so that's just looking at spatial stuff in kind of what should be like healthy tissue. Uh, and here in, in a collaboration with K uh, Kate Marks in Leeds, we, we looked at cancer samples. So we took um, cancer patients, took out a little chunk of, uh, um, well, the, the, they, they, actually, they had the tumor removed and with tissue around it. And then the pathologist took out uh, chunks at two centimeter intervals to try and study the spatial aspects around the tumor. Um, so th this is the, the last thing I'm going to speak about. Uh, you'll be glad to know. Um, the, the, so this is preliminary data. And I've just put here sort of three patients. We, we have more, but uh, we haven't, haven't looked through it thoroughly yet. And if you look at, for instance, this patient, patient 26, the dotted line is the is the tumor and the distance here is in centimeters. So actually, and this is the fusion fission shape that it, it's indicative that you've got, a, so it's a frequency of that. And it's indicative that you've got fusion and fission going on. And what you find is that close to the tumor, you get enhanced fusion fission and far away it starts um, converging back onto what would be a background wild type value. Um, and if you actually look at the clone frequency for that same patient looking at MAOA and STAG2, you find the inverse pattern. So close to the tumor, you have few of these MRA and stack two mutations, and they start growing as you go away. And this is interesting because it could be that the tumor is actually inhib inhibiting the stem cell dynamics around the tumor and enhancing the fissioning and fusioning around it. Uh, but after you get some distance away, the effect uh, drops down. Um, this is by no means the only pattern we saw. And in fact, uh, they, we saw a few of these, but they weren't the majority at all. You did find a lot of them had like fusion close to fusion fission close to them, uh, like in 28 and 30, but the, but the actual frequencies of the mutations we can measure were kind of not super clear patterns. Um, so that's something we're still looking into and we're trying to see whether they're glued to patterns. And of course, this could be either the tumor affecting its environment, or it could be actually the environment that predates the tumor and that's actually the fertile ground on which the tumor was formed. And so these are things we're kind of thinking about and looking into. Um, so just to summarize and sort of wrap up, um, I've sort of described how we used um, visualizable mutations to study human stem cell dynamics. So this allows us the visualizable part, and it's also a very cheap assay, it allows us to look at very large numbers of crypts, very large numbers of tissues, tissue and patients and Look at, look at a handful of mutations. We can use deep learning to extract the information we need to do all our analysis. Then combining that with a stochastic model, we can say something about what the stem cells are doing and just looking at the regular behavior, we found few stem cells per gland and that sometimes a, and a mutation can take on average seven years to become fixed in the tissue, which is quite striking. And we were able to distinguish uh, biased behaviors from neutral behaviors. And then with this panel, we had developed in utilizing what we'd learned previously, 
We could integrate all the clone marks using some of these networks and then study spatial patterns of dynamics, looking for alterations, and then also look in the vicinity of the tumors. And that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to speak about. And just in terms of acknowledgement, I wanted to uh, thank my collaborators. So the Winton Lab in Cambridge, which I've been collaborating for eight, eight years now, I think, or eight to nine years. And it's been a fantastic collaboration. Doug Winton, who's been absolutely fantastic to work with in this group. Uh, and then also more recently, we started working with um, um, people from Leeds. So Kate Marks, who's a pathologist and researcher there. Uh, Phil Quirk, who's a professor, and they've both been great to work with and have, yeah, has been very good interaction. And then special acknowledgements to Doran Kamis, my, my postdoc, who's an absolutely fantastic postdoc. And he's done all the work with the deep learning uh, and also the Mark Friend of the Field. And then I've also got him working on like single cell and dynamics and stuff. And so he's been doing everything like really, really well. Uh, and yeah, thanks for listening.